I'm sure you've all heard the riddle about a tree falling in the forest when there's no one there to hear it, but I've got a new one for you. If the wind chill is below freezing, but there's no one there to feel it, is it actually that cold? Now, this may sound like just another thought experiment, but if you're watching the weather forecast because you're concerned about your vegetable garden during the shoulder season, then the answer to that question could be pretty important. So in this video, I intend to get to the bottom of it by finding out if the wind chill factor affects plants as well. But before we get into it, I know that some of you are likely in a hurry. So I'm going to break one of the cardinal rules of YouTube audience retention by giving you the short answer up front. Because what I've discovered is that, no, wind chill does not affect plants. Or at least, not directly. But for a much more complete and hopefully interesting response, let's dig a bit deeper into exactly what wind chill is, how to calculate it yourself, and why our leafy friends couldn't really care less. Now, if you live close to the equator, at this point you might be scratching your head and wondering what the heck I'm even talking about. But up here in Canada, especially in the winter, the wind chill factor is pretty big news. Or at least it's mentioned in the news, specifically during the weather report, pretty much every day. Usually they say something like, the overnight forecast will be clear with a low of minus 24 and a wind chill of minus 37. But what does that actually mean? And why are there two temperatures? Well, believe it or not, despite appearances, the wind chill is not a temperature. It's actually just a way of communicating the perceived temperature. That's why it's often expressed in terms of feeling like minus 37, rather than being minus 37. However, it's still based on a specific formula, and its purpose is to warn against the risk of frostbite and hypothermia. But why does it affect people and not plants? Well, to answer that question, we'll first have to go down a bit of a rabbit hole by asking what we even mean when we say that something is cold. Because technically, cold doesn't exist. It's actually just the word we use to describe the absence of heat. Sort of like how dark is really just the absence of light. Or how, as our regular viewers will know, the critters in our garden were actually just the absence of fence. Anyway, so if cold is just a lack of heat, then what's heat? Well, for that, we'll have to look a little closer. At this rock, for example. But we need to zoom in way more than this. Because, as you may recall from science class, all things are made of matter. And all matter is made of particles. But the particles don't just sit still. Instead, they're always vibrating and bouncing into each other. And all that movement is called kinetic energy. Now, for our purposes, we can say that temperature is basically just a measure of the amount of kinetic energy within a given object. Or even simpler, the higher the temperature, the more movement in the particles and vice versa. So because this rock is well below the surface, where temperatures remain fairly consistent throughout the year, let's say around 5 degrees Celsius, it would be much warmer than a second rock up above on a cold winter day. And that's because rocks don't produce any of their own warmth. So the rock below ground would have the same amount of particle movement as the soil. And the rock above ground would have the same amount of particle movement as the air. Or in other words, both rocks would take on the temperature of their surroundings, also known as the ambient temperature. But what if we're talking about something that starts out warmer than the air, like this cup of grass tea that we made in a previous video? Well, now we have fast-moving particles in the cup right next to slow-moving particles in the air. And as the faster particles bump into the slower ones, they transfer some of that kinetic energy. And the transfer is what we call heat. Now, this rabbit hole actually goes way deeper than this, but I think we've gone far enough for this video. Just remember that the transfer always goes from hot to cold, or from fast particles to slow particles, meaning that the air is not really making the cup cooler, but rather the cup is making the air warmer by giving away some of its own energy. And the bigger the difference in temperature, the more energy the air can absorb. This is why our cup cools down quicker when it's outside, and for that matter, why a snowball melts quicker when it's inside. In both cases, it's the difference in temperature that causes the heat transfer, either from the warm cup to the cold air, or from the warm air to the cold snow. But notice that the layer of air closest to the cup is most affected. And that's because air isn't a great conductor, in large part due to the fact that its particles are much farther apart, and therefore can't bump into each other as often. So the heat transfer is relatively slow meaning that the warm layer, while it lasts, actually serves as a bit of an insulator. Because before the cup can pass on any more heat, the air closest to it first has to pass on the heat it's already collected 
to the air that's slightly farther away. Once again, the heat transfer only happens when there is a temperature difference, and currently, between the cup and that warm layer, there isn't one. Now, if left long enough, the energy would fully dissipate, and the cup would cool to the ambient temperature. But it would take a while. That is, unless there was suddenly a gentle breeze. Because in that case, the layer of warm air particles would be carried away, and new air particles that hadn't yet been heated would take their place. Now that initial heat transfer can happen all over again thanks to the new temperature difference. And if the breeze continues, then in a short while our cup and the grass tea within it would cool down to the temperature of the air. Just like without the breeze, but this time much quicker. And this is why we intuitively blow on a hot beverage before taking our first sip. Because we're essentially speeding up the cooling process by pushing away the warmed air particles and allowing new, cooler air particles to take their place. But on the other hand, how does this apply to people? Because we don't just have heat, we also produce it and experience it. For example, when our exposed skin feels cold on a winter day, that's our body sensing the heat transfer from our skin to the air. We're not really feeling the ambient temperature, but rather the flow of energy due to the temperature difference. That's why the same pool water feels warmer after a cool shower and feels colder after a few minutes in a sauna. To our skin, feeling hot or cold is relative. However, despite that, our actual temperature is still vitally important. In fact, it's so important that our bodies burn a lot of energy trying to maintain it. And so, when the fast-moving particles in your hand give away energy to the slow-moving particles in the winter air, among other things, your body responds by shivering in order to produce additional heat and make up for the loss. And in so doing, it also reinforces that layer of warm air that helps insulate you from the cold. However, if the air is just too cold, or you're exposed to it for just too long, your body may not be able to keep up. This can result in frostbite, where your tissues begin to freeze. And eventually, if your core temperature drops below 35 degrees Celsius, even hypothermia. Both of which are potentially very dangerous conditions. In fact, here in Canada, more than 80 people die from cold exposure every year. And just like with our cup of hot grass tea, the wind makes these effects happen much quicker. For example, on a calm day with no breeze, if the temperature is minus 30 degrees Celsius, there is a high risk of frostbite within 30 minutes. But add a 40 km per hour wind, and it becomes a severe risk in as little as two. That's the equivalent risk of a calm day where the temperature was minus 48. And this is finally where the wind chill factor comes in. Because, as I mentioned, the wind chill is not an actual temperature, but rather a way of communicating the perceived temperature. Or in other words, the wind chill tells us how cold it will feel. Because again, our body doesn't sense the actual temperature, it senses the heat transfer from our skin to the air. So, since we lose the same energy at minus 30 with a strong wind, as we do at minus 48 with no wind, to our body, they essentially feel like the same thing, and come with the same risks. But there is one difference. You see, no matter how strong the wind might be, it can never cool you, or the teacup for that matter, below the ambient temperature of the air. Because, once again, the wind is simply speeding up the cooling process that's caused by the temperature difference. So, once your hand and the air are the same temperature, the wind chill no longer applies. Now, that may be of little comfort at minus 30, but don't forget, the reason we're even talking about this in the first place is because of garden plants during the shoulder season. So now back to the original question. Why doesn't wind chill affect plants? And the simple answer is that, like the rocks in our first example, plants that live outside are already at the ambient temperature. Because they don't produce their own heat like we do, and they don't maintain an insulating layer of warm air, either. So, because there's no temperature difference, the wind provides no additional cooling effect. Windy or not, the plants are already as cold as the air. So, if the forecast is plus 10 with a wind chill of zero, to the plants, it's still 10 degrees. Now, of course, if you were to move a house plant from your warm living room to your cold garden, then yes, the plant will cool down along with its surroundings, and a breeze would speed this up which is why it's important to gradually harden off your seedlings before planting out in the spring. Plus, strong winds can also bring other dangers, like snapping stems and water loss. But when specifically talking about the wind chill factor, it's really only directly relevant to warm-blooded animals, like people and our furry and feathered friends, those who produce their own heat and whose bodies need to stay at a constant temperature. For us, the wind chill is not only relevant, but also potentially very dangerous. 
which is why it's usually mentioned in the weather forecast and why many countries around the world have come up with handy conversion charts like these. But it's also something you can calculate yourself. These are the formulas used in Canada and the US, and while other countries may use slightly different systems, they're all based on a similar concept. So if you know the wind speed and the air temperature, which you can easily measure at home if you have the right equipment, you can plug them in and quickly solve for the wind chill. But since math can be hard, there are also some handy online calculators, which I'll link to in the description. Now, just for fun, I'd really quickly like to dive into one final rabbit hole. Because if you play around a bit, you may notice that when you increase the air temperature, but keep the wind speed the same, the actual temperature and wind chill factor begin to slowly converge. Or in other words, as it gets warmer outside, the wind has less of a cooling effect. And this makes sense because, again, we feel cold because of the temperature difference between our skin and the air. So as the air temperature gets closer to our skin temperature, there's less of a heat transfer for the wind to speed up. But what if we kept going? Well, if the air becomes warmer than our skin, the wind chill actually flips and starts having a warming effect. Because remember, heat energy always transfers from fast-moving particles to slow-moving particles, or from hot to cold. So in that case, our body would collect heat from the air, leaving us surrounded by a slightly cooler layer. And then when the wind blows, it moves those cooled particles away and replaces them with more warmed particles, which in turn allows our skin to collect even more heat energy. This is why if you gently blow on your hand while sitting in a sauna, it actually feels hotter instead of colder. It's not that your breath is hot, it's that you're now speeding up the heating process. But I should point out that this specific formula only claims to be accurate for negative temperatures, and there are plenty of other factors like the humidity and evaporative cooling from sweat. So it's best not to put too much stock into the actual numbers here and instead just focus on the concept. But with this flip in mind, perhaps the wind chill factor could more accurately be called something like the wind thermal factor, since it technically goes both ways. But at the end of the day, no matter what you call it, it still won't affect our outdoor plants. So I guess that's a good place for us to turn around and climb back out. But in the meantime, thanks for watching, and we'll see you soon.